In this part of our series covering how to play Reality's Edge, we'll look at how movement works. In the previous video, we discussed how the turn sequence works, and in there was discussed how your models will conduct tests using their metal stat to determine how many activation points they will receive. These activation points may then be spent on a variety of different move actions. Move, drop, stand, and charge. Within the move action, you can walk, climb, jump, and fall. So for the basic move action, look at your model's stat line and find the move attribute, and that is the max distance you can move the model on the game board. So if your move stat is five inches, you can make a move of five inches or less. Now during your model's turn, you can take a second move action, but you do not use the model's move stat. Instead, you roll a six-sided die and move that distance unless it exceeds your move stat. So let's say you're a model with a five inch move. And when you roll the six sided die, you score six. You can only move five inches. Now if you roll a five, it's five inches. If you roll a four, it's four inches. So your move stat is an upper boundary on how far you can move. Now if you roll a critical when conducting your activation test, that gives your model a third action. So you can make a third action move. Now on a third action move, you need to roll a d3. So roll a six sided dice, divide by two, and round up. So one and two is one, three and four is two, five and six is three. So in our example here, our model will move the base move rate, roll, move another two inches, roll again, move another two inches for a three action move. Should you fail a morale test, and when you fail a morale test, your model is required to make a move action. In the morale section, that specifically uses the phrase move action. This can lead to a situation where your model can have executed a move action, finished its actions, and then must make a morale test for whatever reason. That means that the model's move action when failing the morale test is a D6 move because it will be the second move action of that turn. Now let us say a model has not moved because it has not made an activation test, it must take a morale test, fails it, and then must execute a move action. It will move its full move rate, but now it passes an activation test and the model is ready to go, but it has already made a move action, so that means it is now limited to the D6 move. Something the rulebook doesn't cover is what happens if you make more than three move actions in a turn. So we could see a situation where a model rolls a critical, makes three move actions, So that's your three actions. And then later in the turn, is forced to make a move action from a failed morale test. We would suggest sticking to the D3 roll, but it is up to the gaming group to decide. Now there are other times you can make a move, such as in melee combat with the push and pull, or as the result of a graze after a model gets shot. These moves do not count as move actions and instead have a set number of inches to be moved. Now let us cover what the rulebook calls difficult terrain. Difficult terrain comes in two types, amorphous and linear. What we mean by amorphous is any terrain pieces that are inconsistent in shape and troublesome in nature. This can be stacks of garbage, shallow water like koi ponds or full drainage ditches, forested areas, or swamps. Stuff like that. This is one of those things that varies by what you have to throw on your gaming surface and what you and your opponent agree to before starting the game. This type of difficult retain terrain requires the model to spend two inches of movement to move one inch in distance. So you're basically having your move rate over difficult terrain. As for a linear surface, we mean vertical surfaces. and what you and your opponent agree to as a vertical surface. But in the case of the rule book, what they're talking about is objects that are less one inch in height, um, like fencing, 
little garden retaining walls, little objects like that. When crossing these types of surfaces, it takes two inches of movement. Now if your model tries to cross a vertical barrier higher than an inch, you will need to shift to the climbing rules. Now this does not apply to climbing any vertical surfaces, so no scaling building sides that are plain and smooth unless you have the equipment for it. The vertical surfaces must have something for your model to grab onto, so anything like a ladder or a chain link fence. It takes one AP of movement to climb one inch in vertical height. However, this is not a universal rule. There is a card out in the rule book which states that the intent of the rules that it would take two AP to climb to the top of a one-story building, such as this using the ladder. That would be two AP. The rule book envisions that a one-story building in 28 millimeter scale is anywhere from 2.5 to 3 inches in height, which is fine if you're using your infinity or bolt action terrain. It'll be a problem with Games Workshop terrain as their current sets go to 6 inches per floor. So this is something you're important to need to work out in advance. Now if the model is climbing a piece of terrain and in the middle, middle that it climbs, let's say they only get halfway, and this object comes under an attack. Either someone goes up to him, hits him with a crowbar, shoots him, anything like that. Your object must avoid falling. So let's say someone shot at the model. Once the hit is made, the targeted model must pass an unopposed strength check or fall to the ground. Now if you fall, you take an automatic hit and you will lose hit points depending on the height from which you fell and you'll end in the prone position. There are three bands within the rule book. The one to three inch fall, the three to six inch fall, and higher, the six plus range. I do not want to show the table to avoid copyright issues, and you should go by the rule book. But if you take a fall higher than six inches, which would be higher than two stories, you're not walking away from that one. It is possible for your model to jump as part of its move action. When you jump, you do not get extra distance unless you have some upgrade or equipment that creates an exception. You can leap over small obstacles and hazards. So above we gave the example of a koi pond being difficult terrain and having your move distance and traversing it. An option is to just jump over it to skip the terrain feature. So as long as the obstacle is under an inch in height, you don't have to do a test for it. If you want to make a jump less than an inch distance, you can auto pass that too. However, if you want to jump more than an inch, the rule book states that you need to talk to your opponent and agree that the jump is doable. This might be a more narrative part of the game and is designed to create cinematic scenes while still being believable. However, if you fail, you will have to use the falling rules we described before. A blind spot in the rules is how far along your jump track your model will progress before failing and then taking the fall. This can be critical depending if there is a variety of dangerous terrain or potentially other models underneath that particular track when you failed. There are currently no rules for what happens if a model falls on top of another model. Now I've mentioned that the models can be in a prone position. This can happen by taking the free drop action or after falling. This is essentially your model hugging the deck and does have the advantages in hiding and avoiding being shot. Because once your model is prone for line and sight purposes, you need to consider it to be an eighth of an inch tall or the height of its base. A disadvantage is that while prone, your maximum move distance is one inch. To get out of the prone position, you will need to use the stand-up action, which costs 1 AP. Now drop and stand-up do not count as move actions, so if you move and drop, or stand-up and move, you have not committed a double move. Now a model in the prone position on the board, you can represent it by using a counter, um, laying the model down, 
or just swapping it out for a regular unused base, uh, which we recommend it'll help make uh, better line of sight arguments. Charging is a move action with a free close combat action at the end. You'll discuss it in the combat video, but I wanted to bring it up here because since it is a move action, you can move towards a target and then charge, but the charge will be at the variable reduced move rate. So you gotta think about moving towards an object. Once you establish line of sight, you can then charge it, but you're gonna be charging it on the D6 or the D3 if it's your third move action. And remember that these rules on jumping and falling and prone only apply to physical creatures. Virtual creatures just move about the board like ghosts. Now that you know how to scoot, let's talk about how to shoot. That is right, our next video will be combat.